Well, thank you so much for coming, and thanks so much to Peter and Ant for this invitation. It's just such a delight to be here. Um, so the paper that I've um, that I'm planning to deliver is um, on Beckett. It's titled "With a Lever." Beckett, Badiou, and the Logics of Sexual Difference. And it sort of emerged out of um, the Badiou Conference. Um, the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy brought Badiou out at the end of last, was it the end of last year? Yeah, uh, anyway, time, at, at some point. Um, and uh, it was just so intimidating to, to be asked to give a paper on Badiou uh, in his presence, you know, and so I completely kind of um, flubbed the invitation and ended up giving a paper on Lacan, which started off as a kind of a um, uh, thinking about Badiou's question of the, you know, that the one is not, and so my paper was sort of like, okay, I'm going to take you into the bedroom, into the, you know, this pre-originary scene of, you know, the birth of the one that is not, and so I did this thing. Anyway, um, Louise Birchall gave a very interesting and very provocative talk um, at that same conference, um, which was dealing with this question of whether or not Badiou has made a change in his thought uh, around this question of the feminine universal, and so in response to that, I've written this paper, um, Thinking about this, uh, thinking about this question of change. So there is a kind of a, a bit of a, a sort of a chain of events that led to this this paper that I'm going to um, present to you today. So this, that's just sort of the background of it. Um, okay. So thank you very much. Over the course of his long career, Alain Badiou has made numerous turns in his thought. As one learns from his works, these have often been prompted by friends and interlocutors, for Badiou is unusually generous in acknowledging his debts, as we all know. His turn to category theory, for example, in his second opus, Logics of Worlds, is remarked by Badiou as, as having been in part the result of an intervention by his friend Jean Toussaint de Santy. Yet this tractability should not really surprise us, given the centrality of the idea of change in his philosophical project. Change, or at least real change, as he puts it, in his Logics of Worlds, implies the novelty which is at the heart of his philosophy. Nevertheless, one would be wrong to conflate novelty with change. If, in being an event, Badiou took issue with speculative, realis uh, sorry, speculative leftism's imaginary wager on absolute novelty, this is because the latter lacks recognition of structure. And by structure, Badiou means the count as one, of course. Novelty emerges from an event that is only discernible through the discipline of time that Badiou calls fidelity. In Book 5 of Logics of Worlds, Badiou formally addresses this question of change. Here, change is understood as the imposition of an effective discontinuity on the world. Real change, it seems, can neither be deduced mathematically nor by logic. Badiou explains, to put it bluntly, the thinking of change, or of singularity, is neither ontological nor transcendental. Rather, change is given not through the thinking of appearing, nor in the transcendental constitution of being there, but as an exception, both to the laws of ontology, being, and to their logical consequences, appearing. The concept of change evidently remains close to Badiou's heart. Six years after the French publication of Logics of Worlds, Badiou delivered a seminar at the European Graduate School devoted to this problem. He opened the subject of change seminar with the question, what is a change? And this is a, a longish quote from him. He says, what is a true change? What is a false change? Is change better than immobility? What are the different types of change? What is a change in society? What is a political change? What is a change in sensible forms? What is a change in art? What is a change in knowledge? For example, what is a scientific change? What is a change in life? And what is a change in private life? And to this, I think we should add, well, what is a change in philosophy? The history of philosophy accommodates several well-known examples of philosophical reversals. Wittgenstein and Heidegger come immediately to mind. However, would these constitute philosophical change in Badiou's sense of a real change? One can imagine Badiou's response. He would likely say that neither Wittgenstein nor Heidegger truly became subjects of their philosophy until their famous turns. That is, 
It wasn't until each of them was gripped by something that fundamentally altered everything they knew up until then that they became the philosophical names who would seed an entirely new tradition. They would not be examples, therefore, of philosophical subjects of change. Accordingly, Badiou evidently named his 2012 seminar with some care. The subject of change requires us to consider a philosophical subject who remains faithful to the event or name that gave, gave rise to it, while no, nonetheless thinking the possibility of change from inside the situation that it founded. One quickly sees that this is very far from the kinds of micro-changes to one's position that might occur on the ground, as it were. The delicate tracery of forward movements and nimble back loops that Spartacus's army might, for example, engage in as they forge their new path under the banner, we slaves, we want to and can return home, as Bajou puts it in Logics of Worlds. And it's even further from the lamentably all too common retreat by an older thinker from some of his or her more robust claims in youth, the opaque, hidden conservatism that seems to overtake even some of the greatest writers in later life. In Logics of Worlds, Badiou gives Saint-Preux the last word on change. I have lost everything, Saint-Preux laments, before immediately supplementing this with the conviction, I have only my faith left. It will be with me until the grave. And Badiou glosses this as follows. What is the content of faith? Very simply, the possibility of a life in love, a possibility attested to, testified to, in an immeasurable way by that which he was obliged to renounce. Through the transitory creation of a new subject of truth, love irreversibly imposes the destruction of the originary social idea, the one that, that separates bodies, consigning them to their particular interests. As a result, then, all of appearing finds itself recon reconstituted according to a different distribution of existence and non-existence. The world is afforded the chance to become other than how it is. And Badiou clarifies that, quote, it is of this other world that the subject, once grafted onto the trace of what has happened, is eternally the prince. It is befitting then, as Louise Birchall has precipiently noted, that there appears to have been a sea change in Badiou's recent thinking of the vexed question of women and universality. In her essay, Women's, Women's Adventures Within the Universal, Birchall spotlights what she cautiously calls a potential reorientation or inflection in Badiou's recent teachings. In the 1980s and 1990s, in works such as Ethics, Manifesto for, for Philosophy, and especially St. Paul and the Foundation of Universalism, Badiou's position on women seemed clear. In order to participate in the universal, one's sexuate predicates, along with all, one, all the other predicative descriptions making up one's national, racial, religious, and cultural identities, must be remarked from the standpoint of the universal, thus rendering these differences insignificant, as Birchall puts it. However, in a paper entitled The Figures of Femininity in the Contemporary World, Badiou makes what Birchall calls a startling claim. Speaking in Athens, Badiou historically pro proclaimed in 2011 that, quote, truth processes can no longer, in fact, be considered as indifferent to sexual difference. But you, uh, sorry, Birchall's startle is justified. In 2006, in his eight theses on the universal, Badiou was still maintaining that there is no possible universal sublation of particularity. But in this later project, Birchall explains, Badiou indicates that women would have a different relationship to if not necessarily a full-blown sublation within the universal than those who do occupy the sexuate position men. Wouldn't this assertion strike at the very core of Badiou's philosophy on his insistence on truth's indifference to differences? Birchall pinpoints the heart of the matter when she exclaims that this would, quote, seem well nigh to border on a recognition of sexed universals. It thus radically calls into question the key tenets of Badiou's thinking 
on truth's universality, the ramifications of which she outlines in her well-informed illuminating intervention, which should be out shortly in this Bloomsbury volume that um, emerged out of the conference. The backwash produced by this claim would irreparably transform, for example, the shapes of women's modalities, as these have manifested in Badiou's philosophical and literary writings to date, where woman's difference has either taken a subtractive modality with respect to the universal, or, in love, assumes a categorical status, which, in a sublimatory operation, that addresses itself to the, to the non-sexual component of the love relationship, would function as the guarantee or indeed guardian of universal totality. But in the new modality of the feminine that ba Badiou proposes now, woman attains to the status of a category marked in the universal, says Birchall. This sublatory modality implies there is sexuation of thought, a position, Birchall contends, that seems absolutely inconceivable from the perspective of Badiou's earlier position in What is Love. One recalls how in that essay, Badiou strictly maintained the univocity of humanity, stating in his fourth thesis, there is only one humanity. As a result, he roundly rejected the idea that truths could be sexuated, along with the idea that there could be masculine and feminine forms of the conditions of science, art, politics, and love. This would imply a feminine and a masculine science, a feminine art and a masculine art, a feminine political vision and a masculine pe political vision, a feminine love and a masculine love, and thus presumably also, as we'll see, a masculine writer and a feminine writer. But this is not the case in the space of thought I wish to establish, he wrote then. So can one call this now a real change in Badiou's thought? Interestingly, in his 2012 seminar, Badiou conceptualizes change as the problem of transmission. In the first session, he reflects on the teacher's role as one who aims to transmit something. Musing on his position, he asks himself whether his goal that year is to change something in the seminar participants. Or he queries, quote, is my goal to transmit something which is already here, which is somewhere, but nonetheless here? If the latter, then his teaching, quote, will not really change what you are, but will merely attempt to complete what you are. Assuming Badiou succeeds in changing his students, it will not really be a change in the true sense of the word. The students will have merely followed a master and failed to become subjects of truth themselves. Yet if what Badiou transmits is, in a sense, already here, if it is something that his students, like Meno's slave, already know, it will scarcely qualify as something new, and thus as real change. Although he does not state it as such, Badiou's reflections here invoke this fundamental paradox of desire. Where does it begin? If the loving encounter inaugurates an entirely new way of being under the sign of the two, what has always been murky is the sequence through which a couple first comes together in desire. And Badiou's comical scene of the teacher's double bind, in fact, helps us perceive the conundrum more clearly. The paradox is as follows. According to Lacan's famous formulation, desire's fundamental property is that it always precedes the desiring subject. Man's desire is the desire of the other, as the well-known catchphrase goes. This suggests that the desiring encounter must either have been led by the other, and so not truly the desire of the subject, or there is no real encounter at all. The loving couple was predestined, and their desire is hence again not a genuine subjective desire. In the former case, the subject would be seduced by one who was there, in a sense, first, which explains why new lovers' earliest question following the momentous discovery of the other's desire is always a version of the literally unanswerable, when did you start to love me? When did you start to desire me? It's a question that literally cannot be answered. And this, uh, the scenario secretly pivots on a, on a hidden third position, 
the one who originally taught us to desire, so a Frau K for our Dora, or a Socrates for our Alcibiades, whose lessons and models we've carefully learnt and faithfully incorporated through our primary and secondary identifications. Nevertheless, this third position, by due cautions in what is love, is illegitimate. It conjures, as he says, the imaginary function of an angel, of something that is outside the situation. So any change the angel might found thus fails by Jew's fundamental requirement that an event imminently produce something new. And in the latter case, too, change appears foreclosed in advance. The other merely completes what the subject already was. A totality of knowledge would precede the des desiring couple. It is fate that simply brings them together. Their love was already there, written in the stars. So their love would not be something categorically new, a new truth body. And now I'm going to turn to Beckett. With a quote from Beckett, the sun shone having no alternative on the nothing new. Badu's lifelong love affair with literature has delivered him ample opportunities for presenting his philosophical uh, positions by way of literary analogy. If Stéphane Mallarmé, as Robert Boncardo has shown, exemplarily offers Badu the poetic allegory for the event, Samuel Beckett, more than any other writer, supplies the literary resources for Badu's thinking of sexual difference. The bulk of Badu's writings on Beckett have been translated into English and collected in a useful volume by Nina Power and Alberto Toscano titled On Beckett. And in it, Badu outlines his central claim. Sorry, did I say, yeah, Badu outlines his central claim, namely that Beckett has for far too long been read at face value. We have taken his writing of the disaster, as it were, too literally. That is, quote, as a sign that for Beckett, humanity is a tragic devastation, an absurd abandonment, remonstrates Badiou in his essay, The Writing of the Generic. Against this common vision of Beckett, Badiou counters with his own picture, one who, perhaps unsurprisingly, cuts a figure not unlike that of Badiou himself. Thus, in Badiou's account, we find a Beckett engaged in the tensile play of two ontological localizations, characterized by an ongoing oscillation of closed and open spaces. And it does not take much to recognize in these geometries Badiou's own dis uh, distinctions of constructible and generic sets. And moreover, in Beckett, Badiou de describes a division of literary labor between the prosaic demands of sameness or, repeti or, or repetition and the sudden emergence of something else, what Badiou calls the latent poem. Operating silently beneath the surface of the text, this poem, which does not appear as such, but rather, quote, holds together what is given in the texts, is found to regulate the thematic recurrences of Beckett's prose through an inapparent poetic matrix. Once again, Badiou's account of an alternating play of an apparent or visible surface patterning that is secretly structured by an inapparent law of the poem recalls nothing so much as one of his own formulations, namely the limping or the lagging moment by which the subtraction of desire and love's truth procedure causes something else, a latent two, to emerge as a supplement to the count as one. And finally, in both Beckett and Badiou, we find a similar insistence on the imperative of naming. These three features which Badiou extracts from Beckett's work is summed up in terms of three key questions concerning movement, being, and naming. Where would I go if I could go? Who would I be if I could be? And what would I say if I had a voice? These questions are what Badiou calls the elementary situations of the subject. Like Plato's supreme genera, movement, rest, the same, the other, and logos, which they implicitly recall, they capture the generic existence of humanity for Badiou. But if Beckett remains the touchstone specifically for Badiou's meditations on sexual difference, it is because the Irish writer also reveals something critical about appearance as such. Sexual difference has always circled around the question of an appearing, that is, 
the appearance or non-appearance of the male sexual organ. The condition of sex appearing would thus be paradigmatic of appearing as such, which is also Badiou's definition of logic in Logics of Worlds. There he explains that his greater logic, quote, is above all an exhaustive theory concerned with the materialist thinking of worlds, or, since appearing and logic are one and the same, a materialist theory of the coherence of what appears. If Beckett is the logician of sexual difference for Badiou then, it is because his work thinks the fundamental quest, uh, conditions of the consistency of appearing in general. Embodying the logic of the appearing of appearing, sexual logic is an archaeologic, one of the fundamental relations or transcendentals that formalizes what Badiou, Badiou calls the fact for a multiplicity to be in the world. Now, it is through the process of subtraction that Beckett's thinking of appearing takes place. Beckett is deservedly famous for his ascetic method, his literary praxis of intensifying reductions that pare away at the surfaces of words until they become almost nothing. Here is Badiou's characterization of Beckett's style, which he describes as an exercise in worsening. This is the law of worsening. One cuts the legs, the head, the coat, one cuts all that one can, but each cut is in truth centered on the advent by way of supplementary subtractive details of a pure mark. It's worth spending a little time with this notion of the pure mark. In being an event, Badiou called the mark the name of the void. There the mark was a purely formal inscription of the event whose being is, as he puts it, without being. He elaborates, quote, the mark of the void is what disconnects the thought of being, the thought of, pure, the thought of the pure multiple, from the capture of beings. But there is another place we've encountered this pure mark before, and this time in the context of love. Readers familiar with Badiou's The Scene of Two will rec recall his use of the term you, the atomic unit. This U comes to replace Lacan's object R in Badiou's schema. Like Lacan's object R, the U is what prevents man and woman from comprising a whole. In accordance with his own master's teaching on this topic then, man and woman as sexed positions are as absolutely disjunct for Badiou as they are for Lacan. And what circulates between the sexes is what he calls a non-null term, an unanalyzable unit of non-being that enters in place of the sexual relation. So the you, Badiou says, is a sort of acceptable approximation of a rapport. And like Lacan, Badiou distinguishes between desire and love. Where desire circulates the you between the sexes, in love, the you is <coughs> subtracted. It becomes, as Badiou puts it, mutually, internally excised. And this subtraction sub subsequently gives rise to two readings, which together, in the aforementioned limping movement, make up the amorous encounter. For love is, as he puts it, the hazardous, auth sorry, the hazardous authorization given to the double function or double reading of the you, claims Badiou. Either the you is read as the common cause of man and woman's misunderstanding, or the you reads as, quote, what supports the two of the positions while being subtracted. And so the you then would be the minimal difference, the pure mark, that supports these two incompatible readings. Crucially, Badiou's you is not an object like Lacan's objet A, which, for all of its ontological complexity, nevertheless retains the status of being. For the object A, one recalls, is the remainder in the symbolic realm of the subject's jouissance. It is what is left over of the subject's being following the latter's renunciation in the forced choice through which the subject acceded to language. This is the process, of course, that uh, psychoanalysis names castration. However, by re reducing, in true Beckettian fashion, the objet A to pure term or atom, 
that is to say, by emptying it of being, but due effectively flattens out the field of desire. He shears the ah of its lumpiness, its irrepressible stickiness and unbearable jouissance. Detopologizing the ah in this fashion, ba Badiou commutes the thing that incompletes man and woman to the depleted confines of pure mark, a form of writing or inscription. And this will have greater import than perhaps has been realized, as we will shortly see. But before approaching this, one can first note that if Beckett enables Badiou to think sexual difference, it is because Beckett's work stages the mark of non-being, that is the you, minimal difference itself. Now we must move fairly cautiously here, for an initial reading might lead one to think that in the wake of Badiou's apparent new acceptance of sexed universals, Beckett would rec represent a masculine writer par excellence. Dramatizing the pure mark, Badiou puts castration as such on stage. And from this perspective, his comedy would be the comedy of the minimal difference that establishes the signifying order as such, so the phallus. And yet, as I said, one must tread carefully through the minefield that is sex. If Beckett's subtractive method is centered on bringing this pure mark into appearance, what it displays, as Badiou has been at pains to insist, is necessarily something inapparent. The pure mark would therefore be the mark of the non-mark, that is, of something that exceeds the play of similarity and difference upon which the language of established meanings depends. So if Badiou also calls this pure mark, that is in essence no mark, the poem, it is a poem whose appearing necessarily takes place through its in or non-appearing. Now pertinently, in his book on, on St. Paul, Badiou chances upon an image that embodies this double logic of appearance and inappearance. And it is the figure of the woman who Paul says must cover her hair when praying. Badiou glosses Paul in this way, quote, Paul's argument is that woman's long hair indicates something like the natural character of veiling and that it is appropriate to emphasize this natural veil with an artificial sign that ultimately pays witness to an acceptance of the difference between the two sexes. But, he goes on, as Paul says, for a woman, true shame consists in being shorn, and this is the one and only reason why, being summoned to declaration, she must veil herself in order to show that the universality of this declaration includes women who confirm that they are women. Woman's long hair naturally veils her absence of the male organ. So to shave her head would be to reveal her absolute nakedness, that is, the nakedness that comes from having no sign of sexual difference. But redoubling her natural veil with a material veil Woman marks her lack of mark by means of an anti-sign, as Fetty bin Slama puts it. The veil, that is, functions in the symbolic realm as a signifier that points to the fact of woman's absence of signifier. Doubling up the veil in this way by crimping or curling the signifier back upon itself to point to what remains unmarked, woman declares her universality. At this point in his thinking, so in his, his St. Paul book, Badiou maintains that one must first testify to the difference between the sexes in order for sex to become indifferent in the universality of the declaration. The same mark that marks woman's difference transforms into a mark that collapses the very difference that it marks. And this is the quote. It is the power of the universal over difference as difference that is at issue here. Birchall clarifies that both, uh, for both Badiou and Paul, the only reason a woman must wear a veil is to show that the universality of the declaration, that is, the, re the resurrection of Christ, includes women who confirm that they are women, or otherwise put, in order that the indifferentiation of sexual difference within the universal confirms the very status of the universal as such. 
So would Beckett be instead then the feminine writer par excellence? One whose remarkings of the mark paradoxically trace out in negative fashion what can never be directly represented in a symbolic system. And if so, would this constitute what Badiou in 2011 intimated as, quote, the status of a category marked in the universal? We must go on. With another quote from Beckett, I can't go on, I'll go on. So going being saying. According to Badiou, one's sexuation does not come from one's biological properties. Rather, sex is decided by where one is placed in relation to these three fundamental functions. It's a remarkable insight, one which takes Lacan's formulas of sexuation literally in new directions. Briefly, for Lacan, sex is, is determined by one's relation to castration. It is a question of how one accedes or does not accede to the phallic signifier and hence to language at the expense of one's being. To this couplet of language and being, Badiou adds the Beckettian dimension of going. Badiou writes, we must understand that whoever is traveling with his or her sack or bag <laughs> is on the side of the feminine. <laughs> Sorry, it's a joke. We just had this wonderful day with Mladen and Nadia left her bag at the hotel and it was just like this, this hysterical thing of trying to get the bag to the, to the um, airport in time for her to catch her plane. So anyway, whoever is traveling with his or her bag is on the side of the feminine <laughs> or at least coming from the feminine. Uh, and conversely, someone who is abandoned, immobile in the dark, is on the side of the masculine. Sorry, it's just cracking me up. <laughs> just thinking because we were talking about the caves and the human fish. It, it, just, it was really hysterically funny. <laughs> anyway, so someone who's abandoned, immobile in the dark, <laughs> is on the side of the masculine. <laughs> okay, I need to take a minute or at least can be said to stagnate in this position. What matters here is that by adding this third dimension of movement to the question of sexuation, Badiou in effect re-topologizes the deflated manifold that resulted from his reduction of the object R to the U. For if a fixed point on a plane can move, as it can in effect on the projective planes of non-Euclidean geometries, it has the potential to generate something new, even inside a closed space, as Gilles Deleuze has discovered in his own philosophical engagement with Beckett. In his famous essay, The Exhausted, Deleuze cites Beckett's silent play, play Quad, as an example of how the repetition of the same movement holds the potential for an event to occur. Referring to the trajectory of the four protagonists whose paths around and through the square have been mapped and timed in such a way to prevent their ever encountering, encountering each other, the potentiality of the square, Deleuze writes, is the possibility that the four moving bodies that inhabit it will collide, two, three or four of them, following the order and the course of the series. The centre is precisely that place where they might come together and their meeting, their collision, is not an event among others, but the only possibility of event, the potentiality of the corresponding space. To avoid such a potentiality, which is the potentiality not only for a collision with each other, but with the centre itself, Deleuze specifies, the participant, participants engage in tiny movements, which he calls syncopes or punctuations. And this is a quote from him. This sway of the hips, this swerving aside, this hiatus, this punctuation, this syncope, rapid sidestep or little jump that foresees the coming together and averts it. Repetition, he continues, takes away nothing of the decisive, absolute character of such a gesture. The bodies avoid each other re respectively, but they avoid the center absolutely. The question is whether one should understand Deleuze's potentiality of the square as the change Badiou was describing. Could we say that by allowing for movement within an inherently statist, that is, constructible situation, Badiou thereby keeps 
the set generic, open to future events while still remaining faithful to its founding name. The problem with this reading is that for Badiou, it's not a question of a constant movement, an ongoing repetition out of whose minor variations something else, a new centre, might emerge. As he explains, staking out his difference from Deleuze in Book 5 of Logics of Worlds, quote, it's not the actions and passions of multiples which are synthesized in the event as an imminent result. The e event, rather, is what magnetizes multiplicities. The event constitutes the multiplicity into a subjectivizable body, not the other way around. Hence, for Badiou, it is a question of both movement and immobility. Badiou clarifies how he has taken something from both Heraclitus and Parmenides in this respect. Yet what needs remarking is that this dialectic of movement and immobility takes place in the same place. If woman is the one who travels with his or her sack, this movement must be thought as an imminent delocalization rather than a propulsion elsewhere. And if man is the one who is abandoned immobile in the dark, this immobility must accordingly be thought not as an externally imposed retardation, but rather as an imminent decontinuation. Love is a migration, explains Badiou, but this is at the same time a mi migration unto oneself. What is at stake, therefore, is an internal or imminent self-exodus, analogous to the self-separating movement of the universal that Joan Kopchick, in one of her characteristically beautiful formulations, describes as a fugitive one, a one that flees from itself. Thus, in contrast to Lacan's contention in his Seminar 8 on the transference, for Badiou one does not pass from one place to another in love. Rather, it is space and consequently time that are changed in love's limping passage between the one and the two. The true change is a change of places, Badiou asserts in Subject of Change, and the creation of a new place for a new process. Finally, it is a change of the world itself. If you can create some new places in the world for the development of the consequence, consequences of the event, you are really changing the world itself and not only something in the world. Consequently, when Badiou maintains in his 2011 paper, Figures of Femininity in the Contemporary World, that, quote, a sexuation of philosophical and symbolic thought is inevitable and thereby accords woman, in Birchall's words, the status of a category marked in the universal. We must understand this as a change not in his philosophy, but in the possibilities for a world altogether. Going beyond the one in the form of a passing between two, woman has not changed her place with respect to the universal. Rather, the world has changed in relation to her. For this would be the final import of Badiou's Logics of Worlds, namely the recognition that an appearance can have a retroactive effect on being. Such a logic would account for how the phenomenal appearance of a particular set initiates a change that succeeds in transforming the transcendental structure of the world. By her appearing, at least in her shape as a new girl, une nouvelle jeune fille, as Badiou puts it in that 2011 paper, woman is the particularity that is not so much marked as a category by the universal, but instead marks the change in the universal as such. And then another quote from Beckett, then all go. At this point, I'd like to return to the question of inscription in order to head off a possible misconception. There is a venerable reading of Beckett as the thinker of neutrality. Leslie Hill, for instance, makes a celebrated connection between, Be between Beckett's indifference and Maurice Blanchot's concept of the neuter. The neuter, Hill explains, would be 
in between positions of meaning, neither positive nor negative, constantly shifting and irreducible to either object or subject. For Hill, Beckett's work would embody a sort of sustained deconstruction and action, a constant shuttling back and forth between different differentiation without differentiate. Like Hill, Badiou also discerns Beckett's fundamental topos as an in-between site, which he characterizes as the gray-black of pure being itself. But if, for Hill, Beckett's indifference is read as, quote, a suspension of subject-object relations and the absence of all desire, for Badiou, Beckett's work dramatizes precisely the underlying logic of sexuation. Sex, in Beckett, is decided by where one places oneself with respect to the following four amorous functions, which Badiou itemizes in this way. So one, a wandering function of a layer of a perilous voyage through the situation, that which supports the articulation of the two and infinity. And then two, an immobility function um, that and I've got protexts, and I think that must be wrong, it must be that protects, that withholds the primary nomination, that ensures that this nomination of the event encounter is not engulfed by the event itself. And then we have three, an imperative function, continuing always, even in separation, and which holds that absence is itself a mode of continuation. And then finally, four, a story function, which, as the work proceeds, inscribes by a sort of archivage the becoming truth of the wandering. Now, in What is Love, where these functions were formulated, Badiou contends that man is axiomatically defined as the amorous position that conjoins functions two and four, so immobility and the imperative while woman conjoins the functions one and three, so wandering and storytelling. Both sexes are accordingly defined both by a movement immobility function and by a linguistic function, either the imperative or the story. At first sight, this su suggests again the possibility raised earlier of sexuated writers. So a masculine writer is stuck with the imperative to go, despite being immobile. And a feminine writer wanders freely, but becomes entangled with the story of her wandering. She experiences a reflexive torsion that would continually turn movement into the representation of movement in a self-consuming circle reminiscent of a snake eating its tail. In both cases, one recognizes something of Beckett's notorious indifference or neutrality, as Hill conceptualizes it, a movement without movement, an inscription under continual erasure by itself. Yet what one misses in any claim that would see Beckett advancing a non-sexuated in-between of the neuter are the two ways that such neutrality, as it were, can <coughs> manifest itself. Because they're sexuated by saying, as well as going, man and woman encounter a stumbling block, an internal limit that constitutes the real of sex for both sexes. For this seems to need constant reiteration. Man and woman are not opposed externally to each other, but to something internal in themselves. This something, for both man and woman, is the limit introduced by language. However, the way each sex confronts this universal limit is particular to it. Woman stumbles on the limit that prevents story from ever disentangling itself from wandering. And man stumbles on the limit that prevents the imperative from ever moving anywhere. In Hill's terms, each sex thus inhabits the neuter in its own unique way. And the reason for this is as follows. Language in it invariably constructs a set. And one can be inside it or outside it. One can even be partly in and partly out of it. But the construction of a set always entails some kind of cut in the real. 
men and women are the names of the only two possible positions one can have with respect to this cut. Both Lacan and Badiou hold to this axiom absolutely. However, this seems to imply that one's position in the symbolic would be fixed for all time. There could be no possibility of moving between positions. One would be precisely immobilized with respect to language, with the further implication then that there could only ever be male subjects, immobile subjects. But this is not the case, and the reason for this comes back to the question of Badiou's you, of the pure mark and its double logic of appearing. And this will now also help to clarify the problem alluded to earlier, that of beginnings, of the beginning of desire of a subject in Badiou's sense, that is, a truly new desire in a consequently truly new subject. We saw how Badiou came up against an apparent impasse in his position as a teacher. If he succeeds in changing his students and sets them on the path of his philosophy, he will have failed to transmit the very core of his thinking. And by the same token, if his students are already truly subjects of his philosophy, there will have been no change. And he might as well have packed up his suitcase that year and gone back to Paris or better spent the week in his own wanderings in the Swiss Alps, which he loves to do. But this is still not the whole story, for there is yet another side to our coin. And relocating this dilemma back to the field of desire helps one to see beyond this apparent double bind. If, as claimed earlier, desire always precedes the subject, this does not imply that the subject is therefore without agency. One may be led into desire, one is seduced by another, but nobody can be forced to desire. Desire is by definition free, although this is very far from saying that one can simply freely choose to desire someone. Desire has its rules. Thus if the other's seduction is to have any effect, there must be some kind of receptivity already there in the subject, some sort of fertile ground in which the seed of desire can be planted. One could think of this as some kind of primordially worn path along which desire can travel. Elsewhere I've described this path as the rivulets carved by the signifier. Formed from the earliest words and sounds an infant hears, these are signifiers that have become invested with libidinal meaning prior to their becoming overlaid with the shared meanings of the symbolic system. Nonetheless, they remain present, operating as hidden indentations in which the flow of language might start to slow and pool. And it's in this ponding of jouissance and certain signifiers that desire can begin to take root. One could call such subterranean scalloping of the signifying chain the archi-inscription of our desire, but this might be a misnomer if it occludes the strange temporality that is in play here, as it is only after the fact that the signifiers will have been desire's cause. It is only after one has fallen in love with someone, that is, that their associated signifiers come to take on meaning. Yet one cannot fall in love, one cannot desire someone without already, in a sense, having predestined them through one's earliest libidinal significations. And it's something like this logic of the future interior that is at play in Badiou's interventions in his Subject of Change seminars. He calls himself jokingly a prophet, but perhaps a different metaphor serves better. Like a lover, Badiou must stretch out to us from the future, meaning that his signifiers will eventually, uh, from, sorry, must stretch out to us from the future meaning that his signifiers will eventually come to ha have for us. But nothing of his teaching will stick unless he also reaches back into our pasts to lay the groundwork for our philosophical desire. It's a difficult and paradoxical task for an old man, as he insists on calling himself in the seminar. It would require the complete upturning of time's ordinary natural sequence. 
Only an old man would have sufficient resources and a long enough memory to recall the future and change the past in this way. Like the lover, the teacher of philosophy will always simultaneously be too late and too early. But here is where the full extent of Badiou's change to the Lacanian desiring schema comes into force. Until now, it has never been entirely clear to me what Badiou's motivations were in reducing Lacan's object R to the atomic element U. Yet if we consider it in terms of the question of teaching, its value becomes obvious. If the teacher's task at heart is to try to transmit a desire, it's inconceivable to think one could transmit the object R. For reasons that would require more space to outline than we have here, the object cause of desire could never be the object of a transmission. It's far too bound up in the specificity of the body, in the singularity of its drives. It simply would not be able to be transmitted without loss. However, a written inscription can be, and this is one of the unique properties of writing, that it can be transmitted integrally. And it was precisely for this reason that Lacan resorts to the metheme. As a writing, the metheme can be transmitted integrally apart from any meaning, as Jacqueline Miller puts it. So this, then, is Badiou's wager. In order to transmit a true desire integrally across time and space, its object cause must be reduced to a mark. For only a mark, that is to say, a written inscription, can wander through the portals of time without being or getting lost. Badiou gambles, however, that this reduction will only be temporary. Once it has re re reached a recipient, the mark has the potential to be reinflated with jouissance, to, great, to gain a truth body in the form of ourselves. In this, Badiou would pose, uh, possess an affinity with Edmund Husserl, who in The Origin of Geometry made precisely this point about mathematical writing and reading. This is a quote from Husserl. The writing down affects a transfer a transformation of the original mode of being of the meaning structure, for example, within the geometrical sphere of self-evidence, of the geometrical structure which is put into words, it becomes sedimented, so to, see, so to speak, but the reader can make it self-evident again, can reactivate the self-evidence. And crucially, it is the dimension of movement that sustains this possibility, this potentiality for reactivation. Not only the movement of the mark through the walls of time, but movement also inside the situation. Movement, as Beckett reminds Badiou and Deleuze, does not in itself constitute change, but is its precondition. Now, if movement to core resides anywhere, it resides in sex. For sex is inherently mobile. Sex is what moves inside a situation. It is the stirring of the subject as it internally migrates in the choice it makes vis-a-vis -vis language in its sexual logic. And it's also the movement of the situation as it suddenly and momentously shifts on its axis to create a new world. Archimedes famously said, give me a place to stand and with a lever I will move the world. Although this external or third place is outlawed from Badiou's materialist philosophy, sex, in the form of the integrally transmissible you, affords a sort of internal lever that can make the world move. Last section. The stare, alone in the void. Would this imply then that one can change one's sex? There seems a new urgency to this question today, just as there is for all questions concerning being, as we turn to face the disaster that Beckett's writing has literally primed us for. But Jew's answer would have to be yes. But this, this needs to be qualified by saying that it is not one's sex that changes, but rather the world. In changing sex, one would not jump over one's internal limit to occupy the other side of the formula of sexuation. Rather, the limit that, dis that decides sex 
would itself have to have fundamentally changed. And where have we seen such a change before? Here is Beckett. They fade. Now the one. Now the twain. Now both fade back. Now the one. Now the twain. Now both fade. No. Sudden go. Sudden back. Now the one. Now the twain. Now both unchanged. Sudden back unchanged? Yes, say yet. Each time unchanged, somehow unchanged. Till no, till say no. Sudden back changed, somehow changed. Each time somehow changed. How did this happen, one might ask. But the question how is precisely the wrong one just as it is the wrong question to pose to the event. One cannot know how events happen, only that they somehow do. The real question then is the same one as the lovers. When? Between the yet unchanged and the till changed, all we can know is that at some point in time the world will have moved. Even if it can only be dimly seen, one should, therefore, keep one's staring eyes open. And Badiou's thinking on women and the universal might be the first sign. Thank you.